Good morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and welcome especially to any visitors we have with us this day. You'll find perhaps in the pews, um, in the little uh, slotted areas, plastic areas, welcome cards, two different varieties, but this one, um, which is our newer one, if you'll fill this out and put it in the offering plate uh, later in the service, um, that way we can stay in touch with you if you so choose. Um, but it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Let us stand and rejoice as we sing hymn 176, Majesty. Let us stand and sing. Together, I will read the part in lighter print, and together the congregation will read the part in bolder print. Listen, Christ is teaching. We said, be our teacher. Listen, the teachings of Christ set the captives free. We said, be our teacher. Listen to Christ's teaching, full of power and authority. We sit at the feet of our teacher. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you this day to learn more of your word, to learn more of your teachings and how they have an impact on our daily lives. Continue, Lord, to guide us and bless us in this time of worship so that as we worship you in this space, we will go forth knowing your power and might and glory, testifying to your goodness each and every day you give us breath. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And let it
please be seated. And now if our children will come forward for our children's time. doing today? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or in the middle? Let's see. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Thumbs up all around. Got a little halfsies. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. All right, y'all ready to learn about our scripture today? So our scripture is about Jesus, and it comes from the Gospel of Mark, and it uses this word a couple of times in this passage, the word authority. Now, I think authority is a really interesting word. In fact, one of my friends, a long time ago, they asked me, Lauren, what is the difference between power and authority? And I thought this was a trick question. I was like, what is she talking about? Like, I feel like I'm going to answer this the wrong way. Um, but it actually turned into a really interesting debate. And we started to realize, you know what? There is a difference between power and authority. So let me give you an example. Let's say you get in your car and you have the power to go really, really fast in that car, because that car goes fast, and you're driving that car. And you technically have the power to drive that car as fast as you want to. But do you have the authority to break the speed limit and break the law by going that fast? No, you don't. Who might have the law to break the speed limits? Can we think of? Perfect example. That's right. Yes, who else might? Fire department, they would have the authority. Any, anyone else? EMS. EMS. That great example, guys. So <laughs> your dad, yes, that's right. Your dad could break the law. <laughs> 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 uh, yes, going to the hospital. Maybe if you, maybe if you um, are having a baby, then you can you can break the speed limit to get to the hospital. I think you get a pass on that one too. So yeah, but do y'all understand the difference between all of us might have the power? to go really fast, but only some people in some situations have the authority to do that. Now, Jesus, the people were in awe of him because um, the Gospel of Mark says that he taught with authority, not just with power, but with authority. So we've already talked about police officers. Who are some other people in your life that might have authority? Think about your parents. What do they have the authority to do? Can we think? What do we think? Tell you what to do. Yes, you said a good one over here. To go past the speed limit. Oh. No, they don't. <laughs> I thought you said to go to sleep. Um, what else might parents have the authority? To pass cars when someone's in danger. To pass cars when someone's in danger, maybe. Yeah, they, they have the authority to keep you safe. Um, what about our teachers? They have the authority to do what? What can our teachers do? Um, tell us stuff that we need to know. Yeah, so they can tell you whether your math problems are right or wrong. They have the authority to say, nope, this one's wrong. Yes, this one's right. And they can give us grades. Doctors, what do they have the authority to do? What do they have the authority to do? They can break speed No, no, it's breaking, no, breaking speed limits. What else? What do they have the authority to do? Anything? I think they have the authority to prescribe us medicine when we're sick. They can tell us how to feel better. Now, what did Jesus have the authority to do? This is what Mark is going to talk to us about. Jesus had the authority to heal people, right? That's one. What else did Jesus have the authority to do? Make miracles. Yes, perform miracles. So he could cause the waters to be still. He could multiply bread and fish. He had the authority to do all these amazing miracles. What else? Anything else? Um, he has the authority to do his teaching. Yes, he had authority to teach. Very good. Well, he had the authority, most of all, to forgive our sins, right? To bring us mercy and grace into our lives. <laughs> yes, that is true. Very true. Okay. All right. So as you guys hear the scripture today, if y'all are in here, or maybe you hear the scripture read back in Children's Church, think about what Jesus had authority to do and how that makes our lives so amazing, right? We get to follow a God who has the authority to heal, to create our world, like our song just sang about. Our God is awesome, and he has amazing authority. He doesn't just have power, but he uses that power for good and wonderful things, and that's what authority means. All right, so can we give thanks to God for his authority? All right. Let's pray. All right. Dear Jesus, thank you for the authority you have in our lives. 
You can bring us peace. You can heal our sickness. You can protect and save us. You are an awesome God. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Y'all are just me. To go with Miss Lee. Please stand as you are able for the reading of God's word. Today's scripture lesson comes from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered in the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as, he, as having one authority, not as scribes. Just then, just that... Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. You may be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, have you ever been underestimated? It seems this happens a lot to Jesus. Have you ever been misunderstood? This, too, happens to Jesus quite a bit. He's teaching away in the synagogue. He's captivating. He has authority. The people hear him, we can imagine, and they are baffled at this amazing teaching of Jesus. And then follows this extra pop-up scene. No one sees coming a demon-possessed man questioning Jesus, misunderstanding the very reasons that Jesus comes. The demon speaks out, and not just in a normal tone, he yells. The message puts it this way, what business do you have here with us, Jesus? I know what you're up to. You're the Holy One of God, and you've come to destroy us. And where does this all happen? It happens in Capernaum, ah, Capernaum, we may not know it, it's not quite as familiar as Bethlehem and Jericho, although it is very important, especially in Mark 1. We read about this town, important because it's where Jesus begins his ministry, leaving behind Nazareth, Nazareth. nothing good comes out of Nazareth. He goes and his teachings are game-changing, he shows up with authority, he offers healing, several miracles he performs in Capernaum including the humorous one, perhaps that later we think about when he heals Peter's mother-in-law. Later, of course, Peter denies him three times. Coincidence? Maybe not. (laughs) But the healing today we often consider to be an exorcism. Exercising demons out of people is not something that we typically see, particularly in our Protestant world, Something perhaps more uh, seen, although probably not even that frequently, in our, with our Catholic brothers and sisters, I would imagine. A little holy water, serious prayers, and out come the demons. And as God does indeed have a sense of humor, back when I was in college, one 
of the requirements for graduating from my alma mater, Meredith College, was that everyone had to take two religion courses. And so I got over the first one, which was Intro to Bible. Everybody had to take it. And the next one was an elective. And I put it off as long as I could because I didn't want to take a boring religion class. <laughs> so I signed up for something that surely was not going to be boring. It was a course called Sin, Satan, and Evil. We watched, yes. <laughs> we, there was such a course. I don't know if it's still there. Um, but uh, we watched part of The Exorcist. A good friend of mine at the time who was Catholic, as a joke, gave me some holy water to use if we ever were to learn how to do exorcisms in class, which we did not learn how to do. But as odd as this story does sound to us, Mark is using this story and all stories to point to the truth of who Jesus really is. He's naming the pain and suffering and that he sees around them in places where things are not neatly packaged and everything isn't aesthetically pleasing, there is true pain and suffering, and Jesus, we know, offers the ultimate promise. I can imagine the pain Jesus may have felt when he was teaching, and people were thinking that Jesus was great. And how would you rate Jesus, this great teacher, on a scale of one to five? And we can see the crowds being polled, kind of like they do for political elections, one being the lowest, five being the highest, and everybody lifts up their five, giving him straight high fives for this. And Jesus, of course, never cocky, always humble, but aware of his power, perhaps might think, and this astounds you, beloved? This is basic. I can do far better than this. God can do far better than this. You have no idea what I am capable of. And of course, the crowd, like the disciples, truly have no clue. They hear Jesus teach in the synagogue, and they are astounded. They're astounded just by listening. They underestimate Jesus by a long shot. And then here comes this man who is possessed with evil spirits, and he seizes the opportunity to benefit from the power of Jesus. And he doesn't just meekly ask the question, he yells it, speaking up, this evil spirit of his own, almost like we can imagine for a moment, or at least I do, this voice of the wicked witch of the West speaking out of him. What do you want to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Come on, Jesus, let's just show off. Let's show off your celestial powers. They think your teaching is amazing. I know who you are, and I know and I think you have come to destroy us. Of course, we know that is never the purpose of Jesus. I know who you are. The great southern preacher and teacher Fred Craddock shares his story of him growing up in fourth grade in Humboldt, Tennessee. Happens to be the same hometown as my husband. And grew up in the late 1930s and in fourth grade, as we often have our fourth grade teacher or some teacher that we love very dearly. He dearly loved his teacher, Miss Catherine. And Miss Catherine taught him arithmetic. And he thought that she hung the moon. Kids were amazed at their teaching, especially loving the gift of math. And he remembers everybody being amazed, just like they were amazed in the teachings of our scripture today. But Fred was devastated when he heard the rumors going around town about Miss Catherine. Neighbors were whispering to other neighbors what was going on, what was being said about this young woman in the small town of Humboldt, Tennessee. Even on Main Street, everybody was speaking about it. It was quite the scandal everybody knew about Miss Catherine. Because everybody knew what it meant when a woman had her ears pierced. <laughs> you could tell a lot by her character, a lot about her faith, a lot about her behavior. It wasn't about how she... Um, buttered her bread, to use still Manolia's terms, it was if her ears were pierced. They all knew what kind of woman she truly was and what she did in town. He said they knew, they knew. And beloved, we think 
we know. We think the crowd knows who Jesus is. It seems in our world today, it is far easier than ever to accrue information. We can read about it. We can listen to it in our radio. We can watch it on TV. We can see it and read about it and experience it through social media. But as Thomas Akempis, and this goes back all the way to the 1400s, in his devotion on the imitation of Christ, warns about just being knowledgeable. He said everybody wants, in some way or another, to learn about knowledge. But what good is knowledge if you do not fear God? What can knowledge do alone? What good is it to your soul? Words do not satisfy our souls. A good life does not clean our minds and our hearts and give us that desire to trust in God. It's not from our talents that we work alone. We know well enough we are given all these things from God. We're not called to be people who walk in our hidey ways of wisdom, but to admit it, sometimes we get things wrong and sometimes we're ignorant. And why would we prefer to be around people who don't know more than us and learn from others from thus think the reason being that pride gets in the way pride would impact how those listening to Jesus were understanding his teaching Jesus would begin his teaching and then they would think that this was the story but they did not know of the story of the empty tomb to come they recognized him as a teacher in the synagogue, but what power of teachings when there was at the empty tomb and he was recognized as teacher Rabboni. The crowd at the synagogue underestimates Jesus and they're amazed at his most simple of teachings. And imagine mis misunderestimating or underestimating Jesus. It's Jesus. Do we not expect him to amaze us all the time? And then fast forward to this demon-possessed man. Pride would impact the power of Jesus. He misunderstands who Jesus is. Have you come to destroy us? Pride gets in our lives a lot. None of us like being misunderstood. None of us like being underestimated. There's that meme that says, underestimate me ha huh, that will be funny and we look down upon others at times and maybe we confess we get amazed as we're uh, mis um, underestimating others looking upon others from a point of privilege in our own lives thinking I didn't know that was possible we even have terms for trying to fix how we underestimate and misunderstand people using words such as mansplating and gaslighting, which are part of our vernacular. And as Christians, how often would we say that we underestimate and misunderstand the power of God? We get amazed that God can do great things, but how do we trust him every day in the small and simple moments of our lives? How does this assurance of faith look like? How do we look for this amazement and not see it in terms of shock. Shocking, yes, it would be if a man were to come among us, possessed with an evil spirit, and speak to what he misunderstands. Have you come to destroy us? Beloved, Jesus is not in the business of destroying people. Jesus destroys evil, yes, but Jesus comes to restore people destroys systems of oppression, but he sets people free. And this man was oppressed with an evil spirit. He's yelling out, and we can imagine Jesus shushing him like someone shushes you in a library, telling him to be quiet, and frees him from all the evil that is inside of him. And we misunderstand why Jesus comes. Is it not to free us from our own sinfulness, from whatever is oppressing us and to make us whole? Jesus' power destroys evil and offers us the gift of resurrection over death. And resurrection always points us to life. And if we live this life in the light of resurrection and resurrection power among us, why do we place limits 
on Jesus. Why do we underestimate his power? Why do we misunderstand his power? Because God's power is far greater than anything you and I can ever imagine. Jesus calms the seas. Jesus performs miracles. His teachings astound people. And he continues to cast demons out of our lives. He continues to free us so that we can walk with Jesus. So we pray prayerfully a prayer of confession as we read this scripture for Jesus to take away the pride of our own misunderstanding, of our own underestimating in the power of Jesus, and for us to be taught the authority of the one who frees us to walk with him each and every day in the power of Jesus. In his healing name we pray. Amen. Beloved, we stand and sing in response. He touched me. Let us stand and sing. Willing and able, please remain standing as we recite together the Apostles' Creed on the screen or in your hymnal 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today we have a beautiful quilt here uh, that will be going to George Herring, who is a relative of Jim and Jane Sparks. So please, uh, before you leave today, take some time to come and pray over this quilt and tie a knot as we send our thoughts and prayers toward George Herring. As we move into a time of 
prayers of the people. Uh, I will offer some requests on behalf of our congregation. Uh, I will respond with, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to say, hear our prayer. Pray with me, if you will. God, we come to you today knowing you have the authority to answer and hear our prayers. You see our hearts. You see the things that we come in uh, to church with today, the burdens that we carry in our hearts. God, we give you thanks and praise that you are our creator. You are over all, and you are able to hear and respond. And so today, Lord, we give special prayers and consideration for those in our congregation who are in need of it. We think specifically of Debbie Smith, Dorch Herring, Betty Sue Heider, Pat Sykes, Debbie Haywood, and Dana Kimry. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Tinka Bates and her family, God, will you comfort those who are in mourning, and may we as the church be the hands and feet of Christ to their family in this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for the authorities in our lives. We think of teachers, we think of political leaders, we think of police and firemen, those in our society who, who hold authority over us. God, we trust through your word, which says in Romans that you are over every authority in this world, that nothing goes unseen or unknown by you. So God, will you guide the authorities in our lives into all wisdom and truth? We ask, God, that they will use their power for righteous ends to accomplish justice in our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we look to our January prayer guide that we are going through as a church together, and we note that today uh, we are invited to pray for prisoners who are being released, who are coming out of prison. So Lord, we know in your word as well in Matthew that you invite us to care for the prisoner, uh, to see those that society has forgotten and put out of sight. And so we pray for those who are coming out of prison. God, may they be surrounded by loving and supportive community as they begin the process of rebuilding their lives. Through the church's witness, God, may these people encounter the Christ who died so that all people might receive mercy and forgiveness and second chances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we also pray for families, each and every family who is a part of our Walnut Grove community and who is in our midst this morning. Holy Spirit, will you breathe just love and unity over each family? We ask that you provide for their needs, great and small, God, we ask that your presence is close with them through the ups and downs of life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for all of those requests, the things, the burdens that we walked into church with this morning, I invite you to just take some space and just bring those before the Lord now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you uh, just for your creative spirit always at work in our lives, rebirthing new things, turning over old things. Lord, we know that you gave us authority as well as your disciples to preach the good news, to shine light to others around us. And Lord, may we just embody that spirit as we go from this place today. So God, as a congregation together, may we pray as your disciples, um, as you taught your disciples, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we move into a time of offering, I invite our ushers to come forward.
first fruits of our lives. May it be used for your glory and your work in the world. Amen. Well, good morning again. A few announcements to share with you. Um, one um, comes from our finance committee that tax documents are ready. If you will please stop in the fellowship hall um, following the service and see Kim McCullman. Um, a note to share that you will save the church's stamp and you will get it more quickly that way. Um, so if you will keep that in mind following the worship service. Um, also to anyone on SPRC committee, as we know we have a meeting um, this afternoon from 1 to 4 and um, at Camp Chestnut Ridge. And if you are planning to ride with me, if you will please let me know. Um, that way we make sure I don't leave anyone left behind. And then our meeting this afternoon for our committee chairs as we plan out some wonderful events for the coming year is going to be at 4.30 in the fellowship hall, so please keep that event in mind. Um, and then Tina, I believe, is going to share with us an update on something. Good morning. So I'm here again to talk about the Valentine's dinner coming up on February 10th. Um, and we uh, ask that you let us know that you are coming and um, but we've already turned in the amount for the food but please we we got we ordered a lot more food than what we had reserved because we have faith that you will come <laughs> um, so we have some um, some of our own are going to do the entertainment that will be Carrie Humphrey and Jason Conway I'm sure you will enjoy that and also we have homemade desserts that evening that are made specifically by our wonderful cooks in this church so we um, have that as a special also uh, and we're going to have um, specials uh, people to serve you you will not have to serve yourself so it will be a treat for everyone so February 10th uh, we're going to gather at 5 30 we're going to start eating at 6 and we hope to see you there Thank you, Tina. Um, and please do make sure to sign up. We're going to have a great time together. Let us stand and sing as we rejoice singing our final song, Jesus. Let us stand and sing together.
May the light of Jesus Christ, our Lord, which overwhelms the darkness, shine on your path as you go from here this week. Amen.